was great. Standing already. Yeah. Wow. Ah, nice shirt right there, classical liberal. All right. This is very exciting. Uh, thank you guys for that. Wow, we got a standing wow. ovation before we did anything. <laughs> this is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way it's supposed yeah, to be. Absolutely. I'm having a very strange week because this is my third event in a row uh, through Turning Point and today partly with uh, the Ayn Rand Institute. I was at UMass on Monday and it was a great event, totally respectful and fun, challenging questions with you guys. Really just a great exchange of ideas, everything that I'm, that I'm living for at the moment. And then I was at the University of New Hampshire yesterday. Live and free and die. Yeah, well, it was closer to die yesterday. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. it, was, it was just an absolute circus there. Uh, they, they could not secure a room on campus because of threats. They moved us, about 300 students, they moved us to a 7,500 seat hockey uh, arena, which was, I felt like I was in an episode of Veep, like, you know, like just like a fake background or something, um, and just, and screaming and, and noisemakers and all of the things that you guys have come to know is, are the things that are shutting down civil discourse. Uh, so I hope tonight that we'll, we'll do it civilly. We are completely open, you know, you're on, I just discussed, we will, we will take any and all questions that you guys have. We have no plan right now other than to talk it out. And we agree on some stuff, some stuff. We disagree on some you stuff. You notice he's to my right. And, and I, in some ways, I've oddly <laughs> become somebody that is to the right of Yaron Brook, which now I'm sure Huffington Post will call me all right. And <laughs> Did you see this today? Did you guys see this today? Vanity Fair, another one of these hit pieces. I mean, these people are not, everyone that I'm friends with apparently is a Nazi, which, you know, as a, as a former member of the IDF. Yes, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm on top of that list. Yeah. Right? yeah. So the point is, if there are any protesters here, he knows how to use a gun, so be careful. Um, Krav Maga. Oh, Krav Maga, Krav Maga, Krav Maga. Krav Maga. that's Krav right. Maga. Okay, so uh, look, we're gonna talk about free markets, we're gonna talk about free speech, we're gonna talk about all the things that I think you guys know that we, we care about and, uh, and uh, we're excited to be here. So I thought first off, I'm, I'm gonna throw something kind of interesting at you. I think something seriously big shifted in the universe last week because of Kanye West. And yeah, I can't believe I'm saying that, but yeah, you know, I'm more of a Frank Sinatra guy myself, but, uh, but Kanye, I think by tweeting seven words, I love the way Candace Owens thinks, he offered oxygen to the space that I think you guys are in and that we're in. He just offered a little space for some other people to think a little bit differently, to look a little more critically at some of the issues that we're constantly talking about. And, and he's talking about the individual. And I, the second it happened, I called you and I said, this is a moment for you guys because Kanye West is talking about the individual. Do you think I'm crazy for this uh, thought? <laughs> No, I think, I think we are at an interesting moment in time. I, I, I think that, I actually think the left, and I know, I know a lot of people disagree with me on this, I think the left is in retreat. The left is completely and utterly bankrupt, and I think New Hampshire was kind of evidence of that. When you're completely bankrupt, when you have nothing to say, when you have nowhere to go, you get noisemakers and you make lots of noise because you can't actually communicate anymore. You, all you can do is, is yell and shout and scream and, and you know, you're, you're like a little child because you're completely, all you have is emotion, you have no mind anymore. And I really think that the left is, it, it's not bad obviously because it holds the universities and it holds massive political power still. But the radical, the, the crazy, the nutty left is an illustration of that this whole thing is in decline. And even Kanye West sees it, right? So it's gotten to the point where even some people in pop culture are looking at these people and saying, no, no, this, this is nuts. There, there, there's, not, there's no there there. There's nothing, there's nothing to, to, to hold on to. There's no values there. Well, what are we gonna do with these people? And I think of all the communities, the black community, should be the one at the forefront of this because they've been betrayed by the left for generations now, you know, since the civil rights movement where yes, the, the people stood up for them and, and marched with them and, and they deserve all the credit in the world for doing that. But since then, the war on poverty has not helped them. 
all the, all the whole welfare state, everything that the government has tried to do to so-called help them has actually made them worse off. And things are worse. I mean, Chicago is probably the best place in the world right now to see this, right? Because they are worse off than if they'd never been a war in poverty, if they'd never been you know, certain parts of the Civil Rights Act, if they've never been this massive attempt somehow to help them, you know, to mother government is here to help you, right? That is an awful, awful sign when somebody says that, right, to you. So I, I, think, I, think, I think they're bankrupt. I, I think they're out of ideas. I, I don't know if you saw Bernie Sanders' latest idea is that the no. government is guarantee a job to everybody. Everybody gets a job. Like, like if you can't find a job in the private sector, we'll pay you. 15 bucks an hour, you can dig ditches and fill them in, right? <laughs> All day long, they can fill, they can fill. And, and this is a serious proposal. We've got two other Democrats who are running for president who have endorsed this, uh, uh, Booker and, uh, not Kamala Harris, the other, the other woman from New York, uh, uh, the New York Senator. Yeah, Gellibrand, right? I mean, this is nutty. Wait, this did, is, you, did you just announce that they're both running for president? I did. I did. Oh, they're <laughs> running for president. If nobody knew, yeah, and, and Kamala Harris is watching, that Congratulations. One. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, th that's just so stupid, right? That, that there's nothing. There's nothing there. The real question is, and, and uh, the real question is, okay, so what? What now, right? What what replaces it? What fills the void? What what is uh, what is the alternative? to this nuttiness. And the idea that Kanye West is talking about the individual, I don't know what he means by that. I see all kinds of tweets by him. Some of them make sense, some of them are completely weird. Yeah. Um, but if we can start having a discussion about the individual and what that means, and, and then maybe what individual rights mean and, and what does individualism mean, and maybe get him a copy of the Fountainhead, maybe he can read that. Um, <laughs> Then it becomes interesting. Then we're talking about the right kind of things. If the alternative is, sorry, make America great again, then I'm dubious. The, the, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, make America eat again. He's a big guy. I don't know about that. <laughs> I think that's just a dent in the hat. That's just. Uh... Um, <laughs> it looks good though. Right? <laughs> um, I don't know that that's the answer. I like this idea of talking about the individual. Yeah. Well, look, I, I don't know that it's the answer either. I don't think, look, as I said in my direct message last week, I don't know what yeah. Kanye's political beliefs are at any moment. You know, all of these people that are now worshiping him as a hero, they most likely will come to regret it when he does something nutty. But I think he offered oxygen to yeah. a space that needed a little oxygen. You know, a few of us, what, what Eric Weinstein calls the intellectual dark web, there's been this group of about 20 people kind of trying to just say, you know what? Some of us are on the left, Sam Harris, some of us are on the right, Ben Shapiro, but we're trying to figure out what the answers are without destroying each other. And I think Kanye offered a little air to that. But also what's interesting to me is the way the media suddenly just went on a complete rampage against him. And, and the lead moment in, in Twitter moments was about far-right Candace Owens, far-right Candace Owens, who's had dinner at my house with me and my husband. I mean, this woman, she's not a ra she's black, by the way, not that black people can't be racist, but they're calling her anti-black, the way that they're, you know, all these hit pieces run on Kanye. Uh, did you guys see the, the uh, piece that Maxine Waters released a statement about Kanye, that he should basically stay in his lane? And, and, and oh, it's wow. like, this is actually the soft bigotry of low expectations. That, that someone dares to think differently, and you say, no, 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 we're, we're going to put Stand you back where, we, where we've kept you. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and this has to be it, fought. No, it definitely. And, and I think he also gives a, you know, space now to other people in the entertainment business that, you know, as you know, yeah. are, are silent because they're afraid. He, and he gives space to, 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 I think, the minority community that feels betrayed by the left to speak out against it, and, and that is, they've never spoken, you and know, they're afraid to speak. To that point, I, almost every day now, I get a direct message on Twitter from somebody that's a public person, either a musician or an actor or something, telling me that they agree with me, yeah. but they won't say it publicly. Yeah. I, I got something today from somebody in, in the music biz that most of you probably know, saying that they, they're afraid to come out of the closet. Well, you, Literally, yeah, I mean, that was the phrase they used. I mean, were you part of Friends of Abe, the secret society in Hollywood? Are we allowed it, it was to talk about that? It was before I, <laughs> before I moved to LA. So there used to be right. a secret society in Los Angeles called Friends of Abe, which was all the directors, producers, lighting people, everybody in the film industry who was 
left of, I don't know, Lenin, a right of Lenin, yeah, right, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, of, right of, of, of a leftist agenda. And they used to get together, at, there was a coffee shop in Hollywood where like every Wednesday they would get, you know, people would get together and it wasn't that many of them. And then once in a while they have these big gatherings and I went once and there were 3,000 people and a lot of people like, I know that guy, I know, you know, all these movie stars that yeah. you don't know and they all stay silent because they're afraid. We're talking about 3,000 people, some of them the biggest, some of the biggest producers in Hollywood, some of the biggest actors in Hollywood will not come out as being conservatives or being libertarian or being anything other than the left because they're afraid for their livelihood. But that's why I love doing these events with you guys because I truly believe this, that we are living in such a unique time right now where everything is up in the air. The, the world truly is yours when you get out of college. Like, every, there is nobody that knows what's gonna happen tomorrow, much less in a year from now. Nobody knows. The Trump has, has just tossed the chessboard up, the pieces are everywhere, and you guys will be able to make the future. And the funny thing is, when I agreed to do some events with Iran and ARI, I got people telling me that, oh, you know, I'm working with these, these far-right maniacs, and I've gotten to know you pretty well, and, and you're constantly screaming about freedom. I mean, all you care about, the only thing you care about is freedom. So it leads me to this. I want to do a little poll, and let's do it by applause so that the, the live stream people can catch it. How many of you at one time were on the left? Yeah, yeah I could be in that too, yeah. Um, and, and how many of you would say you're conservative now? How many conservatives are here? A couple. Yeah, you're supposed to clap. Yeah. Still doing the hands, okay. Uh, how many of you are libertarian? Ah. There's always, there's always one loud woo. For there's a few objectivists. Gary Johnson, ladies and gentlemen, right here. Uh, and yeah, how many of you are objectivists? Yeah! Uh, how, how many of you are progressives? Do we have any progressives here? Oh, we had a little woo and you, you kind of, oh, we got one right here. And you kind of nodded half a little bit, you, or I don't know if you were just shifting in your seat. But it's good. all right, that's great. I mean, I would love for progressives to be here and I'd love to, to take a question from you maybe at the end. Um, so, all right, so we have a little oxygen in this space. I do believe perhaps something has happened where we're starting to win a little bit. Um, I think that they're, they're lashing out the way they are because it's, they're sort of like a wounded animal at the end who you're trying to put your hand out there and offer them something and they only know how to strike back. So just very quickly, I, last night when I was at University of New Hampshire, there was a, you know, they're, they're screaming and they're shouting me down and they got their noisemakers and they're repetitive droning. I mean, the, the chants, they're like robots or zombies or whatever. Uh, but there was a woman in the back uh, who I had been talking about Jordan Peterson and what put him on the map, obviously, was the bill in Canada, the, the trans bill, that if you misgendered somebody, you could potentially face a fine, which perhaps could, could have become a law and then imprisonment and all sorts of things. And Jordan said, I have no issue with trans people, but I don't want the government to be allowed to tell me what I can and cannot say. I think most rational people can agree with this. And I, I told that story and there was a trans woman in the back and, and she started yelling at me and, and you know, telling me I don't like trans people and all that. And I told her that I want her to have the same rights as everyone else and live with the same dignity as everybody else and, and hopefully find someone that, that loves her in life and can find goodness and all that stuff. And I said, is there anything that I just said there that would lead you to believe that I'm transphobic or a bigot or anything? And I could see it in her. She didn't know what to do. So she basically just yelled that she hated me or so, something to that effect. And we, we have the video of this and, I, and maybe we'll release it. I, I don't want to make it about her because I think, you know, the other guys often are attacking people. I don't want to attack people. I want to attack ideas. But I, but I, I thought it was a good example of where we're at at the moment, which is there ain't much left. But now my question for you is how do you show people that they can get out and that they can realize that freedom and limited government and free markets and all of that actually is the answer well, to this. Well, first, before I say that, I just want to support what you said, because I, I, I think it's really, I mean, there really is a backlash against these people. And, and you can see it. I think Berkeley is a great example of this, right? Um, last year, Ben Shapiro tried to speak at Berkeley, and Antifa went nuts, and everybody went nuts, and it was shut down, and the university did nothing. This year, the university said, no, we believe in free speech. We're actually going to let everybody speak. I mean, you'd think they got that earlier, but you know, maybe it yeah. took a few riots. 
And this year, Ben Shapiro spoke, and yeah, the university had to spend six hundred thousand dollars to protect him. Six hundred thousand dollars, so a little Orthodox Jew could give a yeah. speech. Do you, <laughs> yeah. do you realize how insane that is? But in and an odd way, you went to Berkeley, and I went to Berkeley, and it was you know, and I don't think they spent six hundred thousand. But no. they, it was a lot of security. But and it was happened. yelling and it was fine. But it happened. And the point is that I think even administrations at some of these universities are figuring out that maybe the wrong strategy is to just let this run amok. And, and that's a good sign. Um, how do you do it? How do you convince people? And this is the key because the key is to have an alternative. To have an alternative to what the left is offering. And there has to be something positive that you have to inspire people with. And I think that positive has to be at a personal level, I think, I think politics takes care of itself. I don't think the debate at the end of the day and the challenge at the end of the day and the discussion at the end of the day needs to be at the political level. The real question is, do you as an individual want to be able to make decisions for you? Do you value your life? Do you value your life enough to, be, to want to live your life to the fullest and be able to make decisions about who you sleep with and who you marry, and about what kind of business you want to start and what kind of profession you enter without getting permission, right? So once you leave college, do you get to make decisions for yourself? Is your life valuable enough to be able, to you, to be able to make those decisions for yourself? That is really the key question. And if the answer is yes, I want to make decisions for myself, <laughs> then everything else follows easily from that. And yes, I have the tool to make those decisions. My mind, we all have this reasoning capacity. We all have the tool to make decisions and to live well for ourselves. Then everything else flows from that. Then it means that butt out, right? Butt out of my life. Leave me alone. Which is all basically what we're asking politically is let the government be there to protect us from people wanting to intervene in our lives with force. And other than that, leave us alone, because we can take care of ourselves. So I'm going to make uh, your own blush here for a second. I've told this story once or twice. I think I said it to you, uh, to your face, with last time you did my show. But he's not just saying this. This isn't just stuff he's saying. He's, he's really telling you something on the human level that is very true. And I know it because I heard it from him, and it changed my life. So as some of you may know, we were on Aura TV. Uh, the Rubin Report was on Aura TV for a while after we left the Young Turks. And the show, that's when the show really started blowing up. And the bigger the show got, the more that the network wanted from us and, and some of their failing shows, they were kind of letting skate by. And I couldn't really understand that. I thought, you need to be giving us more now so that we can expand. But instead, they wanted to take more from us. And I had never met you before, before you had been yeah, on my show. Yeah. You came in, we, we sat there for an hour, and your own talked about rational self-interest and why you should fight for the things that you believe in and that you shouldn't just give, give of yourself endlessly and everything else that you just said. And we finished that interview. I walked right into the control room and my team was in there and I said to them, guys, I'm gonna leave here and I hope you'll come with me. And fortunately, the guys that I wanted to come with me came with me. And from that moment, uh, two months later, we launched independently and my life completely changed and the show has blown up since then. And I've used those ideas. I mean, the way that I've even built my business uh, has been with these principles. So I know that these are real things. These aren't, he's not just sitting here saying, take charge of your life as if, as if it's some like, you know, mumbo jumbo. It's something that's real. And, no, it, and, and I'm and saying it because it affected and me. And to me, this is like a thousand times more important than politics. I mean, what's really important is what you as an individual do with your life whether you take responsibility for it, whether you really understand that you got one shot at this. <laughs> There's no replay. Every second you live, you don't get again, right? Never waste a second in that sense. It's about living life to the fullest and making the most of that life and not just, you know, we're taught from when we're this big that we should sacrifice for others and we should compromise and we should always do what the majority wants. No, none of that is true. All of that is bad advice, right? Break the rules. I was just with somebody today, and he said he's giving a commencement address to the high school where his daughter goes, and, he's, and he's, the theme is, go break the rules. And he asked me, which rules would you break? <laughs> All, I, what, 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 do you, what do you leave him with? Well, I said, you know, that's hard. I, I need to think of it as a positive. I said, I said you know, Two rules, two principles that are the positives, right? Live for yourself, think for yourself. 
And then what rules does that break? Well, break the moral code that has taught you you shouldn't live for yourself, that your purpose in life is to live to others, that the purpose in life is to sacrifice, that the noblest thing you can do in life is to sacrifice for others, right? No, live for yourself. You want to help others, help others, but do it because it's good for you, because it's good for the world in which you live in, right? How do, you, how do you think the branding here got so mucked up? Because I think most people intuitively know this. I see a lot of you guys nodding, and obviously you know who we are, so we have a somewhat selected crowd here. But when, when we talk about this stuff now, and again, I mean, bringing it back to Kanye, all he did was say to people, think, and that that has become controversial. Something happened with the branding, and maybe it is all the things that we talk about, about academia and that the, the schools, and I'm, I'm sure you guys are, are suffering from some of this here, professors that are, are indoctrinating you instead of teaching you, and if you dare say anything that's, you know, anything remotely close to small yeah. government, you'll, you'll, you know, get guff for it. Last night I had a, a student, or at UMass I had a student who was telling me about all the anti-Trump and anti-conservative stuff that their professor was telling them about. I said, what class is this? Biology. Biology. <laughs> well, but this is real. I mean, I this, this is real. <laughs> yeah. Look, but, but, this is, but this is actually real. So what do you think happened that allowed this to get so confused? Well, I mean, that assumes that it's some event that happened. It, on different issues, it's different things that have happened. So on the issue of living for yourself, I mean, this is a battle we've been fighting for 2,000 years, really, since the Greeks, right? Christianity is anti this idea that you should live for yourself. It's all about sacrifice, right? Um, but the Enlightenment got it right. The founding fathers of this country, the Declaration of Independence does not say, you have a right to sacrifice, you should work for your community, give charity and do community service. That's not in the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence says you have a right to your life. You have a right to your liberty. And you have a right in the most self-interested political statement in all of human history. You have an inalienable right to pursue your happiness, not some group happiness, right? All right, the libertarians yeah. into it. So the Enlightenment got it right. And, but since 1900, and I know this is more history and philosophy maybe they want to hear, but since 1900 or 1800, there has been an effort primarily by the Germans, by the way, primarily an, an effort to undercut this, to, to subvert it in the name of tribalism, in the name of collectivism, in the name of, of, of religion, in the name of fill in the blank, but to undercut the achievement of the Enlightenment. And the achievement of the Enlightenment is two ideas. Reason, as efficacious, as the tool by which we survive and thrive, and individualism, the idea that the individual is what matters. Those two ideas have been undercut systematically from Kant, from uh, Hegel, Schopenhauer, uh, Marx, all the way to Nietzsche. And then, of course, the moderns have just taken that up. And as the left has become more and more and more dominant in the universities, as it has for the last 100 years, I mean, it was bad when I went to school 30, 40 years ago. It's 100 times worse now, right? It's just getting worse and worse. As they become more dominant, those ideas have become the dominant ideas that everybody talks about. And now, you're supposed to be regimented in your whim worship. You're all supposed to have the same emotions. Yeah. You know, you are not allowed to think. Thinking is, 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 is this thing that white males do, and it's, you know, it's, it's right. oppressive. Right. Reason is oppressive. Yeah. Reason is oppressing you. Um, so it, it really has become uh, dominant within the culture in which we live, dominant in the world in which we live, in academia. And this is why I think most Americans feel alienated from academia, because they go, what do you mean? Of course I should live for myself, at least to some degree, right? Uh, of course I, 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 you know, I, should, uh, um, I should think. What's this about not thinking? This is stupid, right? Uh, and you're seeing this alienation between a lot of Americans who didn't go to college and who may be in the middle of the country or, or didn't go to the big, really left-wing schools and the people who go to school, the people who get brainwashed by their professor. Not brainwashed, but, but all they hear is one message. Uh, so. I think it's turned slowly over, over, over a long period of time, and it's a, it's a, it's a turn that's happened. It's deep, right? It's, it's, deep, it's philosophically deep. It's not just something in politics that changed. Yeah. It's something about our view of the fundamental nature of reality and of mankind. So I, I want to dive into that a little bit, because we, we haven't done too much of that together. But quickly, I'm curious, 
How many of you actually agree with what I started with, that something maybe has shifted and perhaps we're winning now? If you, let's, let's do it by applause again. Just yeah. All right. So I, I really do believe that, and, and that's going to be the interesting place. But let's, let's get to some of that underpinning yep. of this, yep. because you know I, I talk with, with so many people who I, who I admire, who are great thinkers from Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson and Michael Shermer and Steven Pinker, who you mentioned, and a series yep, of yep. these people. And there seems to be a debate sort of whether, whether reason alone is enough of the bedrock to, to form free societies or whether that has to come from, as you know, Shapiro calls it, an unmoved mover or from some other belief in something. That basically, I, I had a, a conversation with Michael Shermer and Dennis Prager on my show about this, yep. about God and morality. And, and Dennis's position, Dennis, of course, is a believer, Dennis's position is that on a micro level, any of us can be good without God, that we can, we can choose good things and be moral, et cetera, but that on a macro level, a society can't without God. Now, obviously, my, uh, Michael Shermer takes the opposite position, which is where you are, yeah. um, but can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, and, and let me just say before I talk about even that, that, that Michael Shermer and I are gonna disagree about what morality is. We're gonna agree that you can have morality without God, but we're gonna disagree about what morality is. And even this issue of a reason, Sam Harris and I might disagree on what reason is, right? And what it really means. So there's a lot of juicy, interesting, philosophical discussions to be had. Yeah, I mean, you which, and Sam, which, you and Sam which disagree. Is what the, you, you guys disagree on free will. Which, is, which you can't have allies. reason without free will, in my view. So he's talking about reason. What does it even mean if, you, if you're not even making choices, if it's not you making choices, if you're just an automaton? So if you disagree with free will, you disagree really about everything. But that's, that's, to me, where the juice is, where the real interesting discussion is. And I think what the left, the, 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 the nutty left has done is it's excluded itself from even this debate because it won't even engage, right? They just yell and scream and, and, and shout. But the interesting debate is happening, can happen, should happen, between Jordan Peterson, between uh, Sam Harris, myself, the Weinsteins. These are the people who should be having this debate because there's real philosophical issues to be worked out. Right? to be understood, to be discovered, to, to, be, to be figured out. It's not simple, it's not straightforward. Now, the idea that morality, morality is a code by which to live your life, by which to make important decisions in your life, right? To, to, to know what is good and what is bad, what is the right path and what is the wrong one. The idea is that is dependent on something written in some ancient book, or is dependent on some person's ability to commune with spirits, right? Which is basically what religion demands. Either you believe in some book or you commune with spirits and get information directly, or you have an intermediary who communes with the spirits and get, but even when I say it, it sounds so ridiculous, it's, it's hard to take seriously. But, you know, so, so if I don't believe in the spirits and I don't believe in this ancient book, I can't make proper decisions about my own life now, take Dennis Prager's argument that, yeah, you can, you can, but as a society, we can't. What does that mean? That means that most of you can't. It means that most of you are too stupid to take care of yourself. Most of you are too stupid to understand what right and wrong is, what's good for your life, what's bad for your life, what will lead to horrible consequences, what will lead to good consequences. And therefore, we, use, we need to sell you a story about fairies and gremlins and, and, and stuff in order for you to be moral, in order for you, and now that to me is absurd. Morality is about figuring out, and this is where, funnily enough, Sam Harris and I, at least on the approach, agree. Morality is about looking out at the world and empirically figuring out what is good for human beings and what is bad. What leads to flourishing and success and what leads to destruction, death, disease, and starvation? That's what morale, and then do the things that lead to success and avoid the things that lead to death and destruction. Not that hard, right? Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that, a little harder than that. But basically, that's the, that's the chore that your ethics department, if you have a philosophy department, your, your ethicist should be thinking about. What are the actions, the values that people should pursue that lead to success in life, that lead to flourishing, to happiness, to just a, a, a sense of well-being about the world, and what are the actions? And since we're all of the same species, although most of the time well, I think that, yeah, most yeah. of the time, um, 
you know, if you eat, if all of us eat cyanide, we pretty much all die. Right? There's sudden. We got a great ending of this show, by the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, so just stay tuned for that. Yeah, and, and they claim we were cultists. Yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> I'm really trying to max out the YouTube views. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> we have a particular nature. So just like we have a particular nature in the material sense, it's a, if you take a knife, you know. <laughs> I'm just waiting for, for Dave's... Yeah, uh, right. yeah. <laughs> certain things have certain impacts. The same thing in the spiritual realm. If I lie all the time, it has a certain impact on my life. Not a good one. So it's pretty easy if you're a kid and experiment a little bit with lying and test it out a little bit to figure out lying. Not a good strategy in life if you want to make friends and make money and be successful. Only profession in the whole universe where lying actually leads to success is politics. yeah and, and that's why who cares about politics it's a boring <laughs> stupid subject right but every and, and and i always say have you ever met have you ever met a happy flourishing really a politician who you go wow what a life this person lives yeah. Oh my God, yeah, Bush. No. Oh my God, no. The whole Bush clan looks like miserable, pathetic human beings. I mean, the last, the last guy who gave you that sense was probably George Washington, right? And, and oh, oh, I mean, I can't think of it. Look at, look at the Clintons. I mean, they look like they want to slit their own wrists. Yeah. I mean, so the, the, the idea is, let's go out there. This is what morality should do. Let's go out there and figure out what leads to human success, what to leads to individual human success, and do that. And that's what morality is. Morality is not some mystical, crazy, strange science that we have to commune with the spirits in order to figure out. No, it's an empirical science, just like any other science. What succeeds, what fails, let's do the stuff that succeeds, and don't do the stuff that fails. That's it. So, no, you, you, you and, and, it, it, succeed means live well, and live well means long term because, you know, Ben's going to come in and say, what about the chick at the bar? You right. really want the chick at the bar, right? right? I mean, he did that on your show. Like, no, I don't really want the chick at the bar because I know the consequences of the chick at the bar. So it never, it never really enters my mind, right? Because I love my wife and I want to stay with her and this is stupid, right? <laughs> so there is no short term self-interest. Short term is a whim worshipping, going by emotion. It's anti-self-interest. It's anti-moral. It's immoral. So don't do it. No. So, no. I, 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 and the flip side is that what is religious morality? It's whatever somebody, you know, made up. It's unconnected to reality. It's non-scientific. It's made up stuff. Um, and it's completely subjective. And it means actually nothing. It's, it's the least objective morality possible. Because it's, it's, you know, this is why, how many sects of Protestantism are there? Like, I don't know, 100, 200, 1,000. A lot, yeah. Right? Because they don't feel like following that commandment, and they go and do it on something else, right? They start their own sect where you're allowed to do that thing, right? If you put a, a 50 rabbis in a room to study a particular paragraph, how many opinions are you going to have on that paragraph? 51. At least. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... You know, what, what, where's the objective nature of morality coming out of, of this experience? No, the only objective morality is in a morality that is derived from real reality, from, from the world out there, scientifically. Right? It's science. So what I love about this conversation is that all of the people that you just mentioned that we've been talking about, that I know you guys follow and listen to podcasts and things, these people are actually friends. And, and, and truly comrades, I know a bad word for a group of freedom lovers here, <laughs> comrades in the best sense of comrades, but, but the fact that these people, whether it's Dennis or Michael or whoever, that at the end of the day, whatever those differences are, we're actually relishing those differences at the moment. I mean, we really are, and I think that that's what's driving people to us, that this endless hysteria has now driven people. I, it, it would have never made sense to me well, but five years ago, before yeah. I really was doing this version of what I'm doing, that I, all I would be talking about every day is that you should live life free. And once, once that hit me, once I really had that revelation, well, then it did change a lot of my politics. And I know you think the politics part are the, are the boring part of this, but it led me to now being for free markets and some of those other libertarian and classical liberal 
position. No, I think that's right. But I think this is the kind of debate that needs to happen, right? The, the kind of philosophically deep debate about these issues that matter. And you can have this debate and still be respectful and still respect the other side. This is not easy stuff. It's not obvious, right? And, and it's, it's interesting and engaging to have the debate and the discussion. And I think that's what you're facilitating. What you're facilitating is really the creation of why this movement is kind of building around Dave, right? Is because Dave is facilitating a conversation. And would, would, uh, would I and Ben Shapiro have a conversation independent of Dave? I don't think so, right? I mean, there's a certain, or, or Brett Weinstein, or, because we come from things so differently, but the conversation, I don't think we're gonna convince each other. I never go into a debate thinking I'm gonna convince the other guy, never. No, even if, but you guys are gonna benefit immensely from it, and, and thousands of other people are gonna benefit immensely from hearing two intelligent people who disagree talk about a topic that's important in a respectful, you know, rational way. The world benefits from it, even if we don't, we're not, again, we're, we're, most of us are too old to, to, to really change these, these ideas and we're too fixed in our ways, but the conversation is fascinating and benefits all of the people who listen to it. Yeah, so well, I, that, that, I that's, that's why a, I love, that's why I love coming to colleges. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you guys care about this stuff is amazing to me. I mean, I'm not that much older than you. I'm a little, I was in college in 94 to 98. I'm, I'm 41. I spent four years they smoking pot. Born there. They weren't the, even born there. You guys, what year were most of you guys born? 98. Oh, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> this thing is so great. This is why I stopped being a professor. Oh. You see, the thing that sucks most about being a professor is every year your students get younger. Oh. Every now I'm looking at you. Year. You are young. Jesus. Um, yeah, but I spent, I spent four years in college smoking pot and playing Sega Genesis. Yeah. The Libertarian, uh, yeah. there's always Same one. There's always, I can't tell if you're just applaud everything or the, the choice things, but either way. But the, but the fact that people are at college and coming to events like this and thinking about these things yeah. is kind of beautiful. But let, let's move to a, a little bit of the political sure. stuff uh, because we were going to talk about free markets a little bit because that's one of the things that I definitely have changed. And, you know, most of my liberal beliefs about live and let live, and especially on the social things, that, you know, gay marriage, of course, and, and you, know, you should be able to drink whatever you want and smoke whatever you want and the rest of that, that has not shifted. But I definitely have shifted as I've, as I've come to this world and had these discussions. I definitely have shifted right, I would say, economically, because I've realized that you should keep more of what you earn so you can do what you want with it, whether it's spend it on yourself or donate it to causes that you believe in, uh, that the government basically is, especially the federal government, is just this giant monster that is constantly wanting more. And, you know, look how pissed all the Trump people were when he signed this omnibus package because he came in and said, we're going to drain the swamp. And what did he do? He signed the same old thing that funds Planned Parenthood and a bunch of other things that his base hates. So the government just, the federal government especially, just keeps growing and growing and growing. I told you about the obscene check that I wrote as living in California. That's, that's at the state level, of course. Um, but I think it's interesting that once you get the ideas of freedom, it's pretty obvious that it's completely linked to how your economics will change as well. It is. I mean, at the end of the day, you should have the power to make decisions about your life, right? But if you're, if you're in California and you're, you're, you're poor and you're trying to break through, you know, you have to spend like 2000 bucks to get a license to shampoo hair, right? I mean, that's insane. You have to open a, you have to get a, a, a $20,000 government approved program to open a nail salon and because, you know, they, we're all going to be infected with that fungus and we're all going to, you know, it's just the government needs to protect us. Otherwise, what will happen in the nail salon, yeah. right? But what would you say to the people that say that, well, wait a minute, if we left everything to be unregulated, that, you know, the nail salon would be dumping the stuff in the river and all, just all the sort of hysteria on this, that the government is the, is the unit that has to come in and make sure that people aren't killing each other and infecting each other and a whole bunch of other stuff. That it is hysteria, that it's nothing more than that, and it's based on history that is told from an hysterical perspective that's not true history. The fact is that markets are brilliant and beautiful at regulating themselves. And can I articulate for you the solution to every one of these problems that exists in the market? No, because the market usually comes up with solutions that I could never imagine. But the fact is, 
I, I was, I've listened, I listened to NPR, I, I admit it. Wow. I'm, you know, guilty as charged. <laughs> but LP, LPR, when I lived in California, I'll tell you where I live now in a minute, but when I lived in California, I was writing those very large checks to the government. Um, I used to listen to NPR, and they used to run these stories about farming and about food safety, because food safety is a big deal in California. And they used to interview the farmers, and without NPR really realizing what they were doing, the farmers would basically say, look, the, the people who come here from the FDA, eh, we can manage them, that's not really a problem. It's those guys from the supermarkets who come and inspect our food. They're really difficult, right? It's really hard to get by them, right? So who has an incentive to make sure your food is safe? McDonald's does, the supermarket does, the restaurant selling you the food does, not some lazy, lazy, whatever, bureaucrat who's not gonna lose his job if there's E. coli in the salad because he's a government employee and can't lose his job. But believe me, if that was a private contractor that supervised the salad and it got E. coli, they are gonna lose their job. The restaurant might lose millions of customers and go out of business. There's real consequences in the real world if something goes wrong. And people, so I, I often say, you know, I walk into the elevators anywhere in the United States and you got a little diploma on the wall. And it says, uh, a government supervisor supervises this elevator and it will not fall, you will not die, don't worry. Because we know, right? We know, all of us know, that if not for the government, elevators would be falling all across America, <laughs> killing people. <laughs> but we laugh, right? Everybody laughs when I say that. But we really believe that. I mean, really believe that, right? Anybody here who considers himself uh, anything short of a true free marketer believes that because you believe in regulations and all regulations are based on that assumption. Right? McDonald's, the way, if, if you let McDonald's completely unleashed, right, they would basically sell you tainted meat because the best way to make money is to kill your customers. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, and the best way to run a nail salon is to create fungus in the nails or whatever it is that the danger is in the nail salon. I mean, that is bizarre and that's not to live in the real world where business people are the most diligent people in the world to try to make sure that they, uh, they, their businesses are safe, that they, they're, they're selling a good product. And those who are not get, get, go out of business very quickly and get eliminated by the marketplace very quickly. And yeah, the, a, a free market is riskier, is riskier. There are risks in a free market. There is noise in a free market. There is ups and downs in a free market. In a sense, it's riskier than a controlled market. But the controlled market, the real risk of a controlled market is it goes nowhere. You, you can't live. You, you, you get told what to do, what to buy, what, what to eat, what to drink, how to live. And if you, and this is the thing I ask liberals, right? If you don't think other people should have a say in who you sleep with, then how can other people, how should other people have a say in what you sell? Uh, how, how is it that other people should have you say in how you sell it? Or, or what, what makes business different than any other activity in life that you think should be free? What is it about money that, that suddenly other people get a say in how you do your own business. And, and you know, it is, it's, it's the, the, the left is, is fundamentally Marxist, they're materialists. So what they really care about, what, and, and I see this in debates when I do about inequality, what they really care about is money. See, I don't care that much about money. They really care about money. So what they want is the money and they want to redistribute it, and they want to take it, and they want to decide where it goes. They don't care about the spiritual stuff. They don't care about sex. They don't care about all that stuff. That's why, yeah, you can do whatever you want with that. You can live your own life that way. The right cares about the spiritual stuff, right? They, they come from religion where spiritual is important. So that's what they want to regulate. That's what they want to control. That's what they want to tell you how to live. But they don't really care about money. Money, the spirituals, so they don't really care about money that much. So that you can do whatever the hell you want with, right? So. I say, no, I care about both. I care about the spiritual, I care about the material, and I want to be able to make my own decisions about both. And it's none of your business if I go bankrupt. It's none of your business if I, if I commit, I don't know why we're on suicide today. Yeah, well, I'm on suicide, not you. <laughs> uh, uh, suicide watch. Uh, if, yeah. if somebody commits suicide, it's none of anybody's business what I do with my life. My life is mine. And, and then people say, well, what about the poor? And I'm tempted, right, always to say to somebody like that, why do you care? Because I really want to know, why do you care? Now, I care about the poor, at least I care about some poor, I don't care about all the poor. But I want to know why is it that the first response I get from any audience is, what about the poor? 
right? What is it, what, what triggers that, right? A, you assuming the poor can't take care of themselves. I don't. I assume they're just as human as anybody else. They have the capacity to work. They have capacity to produce. Actually, if you let them free, they can become anything they want to become, right? There, there are no limitations. Um, and, and in free economies, the poor rise up and, and they do very well. And indeed, the only place where poor rise up is in free economies. Why do you care? It, 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 how many people really can't take care of themselves, really can't find a job, can never do any of that stuff? How many people really can't and you know, cannot? And they don't have any family members to take care of them. And they don't have any friends to take care of them. They really destitute and nobody's there to help them. How many people like that are there in the world? Yeah, or in America? I mean, how many? What's a percentage? Give me a percentage. Well, Jordan Peterson would say that the, that the military doesn't let people in with the average IQ of 83. Yeah. That's 10% of the population. Yeah. So I know a lot of people in the 10% of the bottom population. They can, they can do stuff I can't do. I, you know, I, I was watching this guy clean my windows. We were watching today at a high rise here in Chicago, cleaning the windows, sitting there, cleaning the windows. Right? You don't need a high IQ for that. But you know what? I couldn't do it. You, you put me anywhere close to that thing, and I'll, I'll, run, for, I'll run for the hills. Despite but, his apparent death wish today. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> so I, I disagree with Jordan on that. The, the bottom and believe, I was in the army. I was in the military. And believe me, the Israeli military did not exclude the bottom 10% of the distribution. <laughs> I was with them in a tank. And... I know, I, this, is, this is real life, right? I mean, the dumbest people, I, I met in, these, in the army, I met the dumbest people I've ever met in my life. I mean, really, really low IQ people. But were they decent people? Absolutely. Could they function? Absolutely. Could they function in a, in a combat? Absolutely. So I, I the, the fact that the American military can, what's that? They can clean the windows. Hang on, we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up at the end. No, 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 we'll throw no. It at the end. but I'm saying that they can clean the windows. They, there are plenty of jobs. There are plenty of jobs for people who can't who, who are at that level, and they do the jobs. There are plenty of people with an IQ of under whatever number you want. I, I know people with Down syndrome who beg, you know, who go and work and are making a living, right? So the percentage of people who truly cannot take care of themselves is under, well under 1%. And then the question to any audiences. And then now we're talking about that's under 1%. Now how many of those don't have family and don't have friends who could take care of them? That's an even smaller percentage. And then I ask every audience in the world, how many of you are willing to put a little bit of money into a pot in order to help that fraction of 1% of people who really cannot take care of themselves under any circumstances? And everybody in the room raises their hand. So what's the, what do I need? Some government bureaucracy with 50,000 different programs employing hundreds of thousands of people, institutionalizing people, convincing people that they can't take care of themselves. Yeah, well, let, let's sit there for a second, because I think this is interesting, because even if the number, let, let's say your numbers are off, let's just say it was 5%, right? So I'm, I'm more than tripling the, the numbers that you're talking about. That if people were given back more of their money, because we're funding all of these absurdly ridiculous uh, bureaucratic monstrosities, if people were given back some of that money, if you actually care about poor people, and I, I do believe that you can ask the question, well, why yep. do you? Yep. But I do believe people want to do good, but if you had more money in your pocket and you knew that the government was not going to take care of those people, then I do think people would give more. And I, I, I also see this with you know, something like Planned Parenthood, which in and of itself I don't have a, a great issue with, um, but there is a certain amount of people in the United States that are against them providing abortions, and I get it, it's a small percentage of what they do, but if the government was to not fund Planned Parenthood, which I wouldn't have a problem with, wouldn't all of these celebrities that are constantly talking about all the great things about Planned Parenthood, and all of these people with money, if you're not changing the laws, wouldn't they put more money in? And this is where, this is where it does come down to personal responsibility. You can make the world you want with your own money and your own resources and skills and volunteering and the rest of it, as opposed to just, I think what it is really, I think the answer to your question is, it's just laziness. It's, 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 just, it's just going, ah, you know what? Let them take my money, do whatever well, they want. And they always have money for bombs, but we don't have money for this. And, well, I always find people say, you know, I would do it, but those yeah, assholes over there wouldn't do it right. at all. You know, wouldn't do it. And therefore we have to force them because we know it's the right thing to do. It's the moral thing to do. 
But is it the right thing? Is it the moral thing to do? I mean, charity is fine, but charity doesn't define what morality is. Charity doesn't define being moral. And taking care of the poor is not that, it's not that important. It's not that important to any of you. It's not that important to me, right? Be globally, right? Because the fact is, I could write a big check right now and send it to Africa and save a bunch of kids' lives. I know that. And I don't. Because the fact is, it's not that important to me. And I'm willing to say that. It's not. And it's not to you. You're just, most of you just won't say it, right? Because there's a kid dying every day in, in, in Africa that you are not saving, right? Think of it that way. This is, uh, 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 what's his name? Peter Singer's, Peter Singer's a famous philosopher. And this is the case he makes. He makes, you should care because you should care about everybody. I don't care that much about everybody. I care, the closer you are to me, the more I care about you. The further you are from me, the less I care about you because I care about myself. Now, again, I don't want to live in a society, in, a, in my society, my particular society, my city, whatever, where people, where I know people are dying because nobody's taking care of them. So I'm willing to give a little bit of charity to do that, a little bit, up to a point, right? But there's even another context that I think people evade here. We know the direct correlation between wealth creation and freedom. I mean, this is one of the real truism in economics that you, you cannot dispute, right? It's, it's in Steven Pinker's latest book, which you should really read because the, the, the chapters about how good the world is are just amazing and true, right? We know, I mean, even Steven Pinker, who comes from the left, will say, this is because of markets. This is not because of government, this is because of markets, right? So we know the correlation. Imagine the United States, with, with all the human resources we have in this country, if we had a free market in this country, I, I can't imagine how rich we would be. I mean, we think we're rich because we get an iPhone 11 next, this year, right? I always bring this out, right? I always have to, right? Because I think this is the, like my set of my universe, right? We th but if you do the math, if you just add like 2% of GDP growth over the last 20 years, what, how richer we would be, we would be like an iPhone 100. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine if the United States had grown, I can't remember the exact number, so I, I might be off a little bit, but like 1% GDP less from the beginning of the, of the 20th century till the end, we would be today poorer than Mexico. 1% compounded makes a huge difference. So if we had a free market in the United States and we were growing at 5%, which I think is conservative in this country, 5% GDP, we would be so rich, the issue of the poor would never come up. Because A, we could write big checks because we were so rich, but B, they would be able, the, the amount of money we would pay to have our windows cleaned would be high because we could afford it. So everybody's standard of living would, would, would rise up as it always does. People talk about rising boats. They do rise. People talk about trickle-down economics. I like to call it flood-down economics. Huh. It's not trickle, right? Every, every, every simple job that's out there is, is a consequence of an entrepreneur who created it. Every, every, uh, every time that somebody gets, uh, gets a raise, it's because capital is being invested and productivity of labor has gone up. It's a flood down. It's, the, it's, the, it's the, the, the capitalists and the entrepreneurs and the business leaders who create the jobs, who create the economy, who drive the economy. So if you set them free, the amount of wealth we would have, the amount of prosperity we would be living under is unimaginable to anybody living today. What's interesting about this, I'd like to shift this a little bit to technology, sure. but I think it's, it's a great segue to that because if you listen to all of the people right now, mostly on the left and the, and the Bernie set of people, you know, they're talking about this $15 minimum wage. We also are living in a time when robots are literally replacing humans. I mean, I was at the airport in Seattle not too long ago and at the, uh, I forget if it's Burger King or McDonald's, instead of people, they now have, you know, it's just a big iPad. And I've seen that in some other places. So the more that we demand these businesses not have capacity over what their own business decisions are, the more we're not gonna be able to give people decent jobs. And also the concept, you know, it's, it's so interesting because Bernie will talk about, well, $15 an hour isn't a living wage, but you don't want that many people to have those jobs. That, that should be your entry job to go get some other job. And also it's like, I know this, and this is where my, my values have collided with my, my own business is that right now we're, we're trying to expand the show and we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do and I get, I get hundreds of people offering to work for me for free and I don't want, I don't even want my interns for free. I mean, I, I wanna pay people. But the idea that I would have to pay someone 
X amount. Now, I want to pay my guys more than $15 yeah. an hour, and we're trying to figure out all sorts of things. And we, by the way, we pay 100% of my employees' health insurance. If you're looking for a, another job, I could take care of you. Um, but I'm not moving back to California. Yeah, you're, he's out. I <laughs> want to gone. talk a little bit about California, too. Yeah. But, but the idea that the government can manage these things, that the, I mean, Bernie has never created a job. He's never created anything. I, I, I think he has three or four houses. He doesn't let poor people live in those houses. Uh, you know, he's made a lot of money off of being a government, uh, being a senator for 30 years who's pretty much done nothing. And if you really include getting across the aisle, he's really done nothing, but it all sounds good. That, that was the point that I was trying to make, that ultimately it just, what you said about I don't care about poor people, it sounds, it, even to me sitting here, it no. doesn't sound good. No, I know. But then Bernie comes in and goes, ah, $15, everyone's going to college, blah, blah, blah. And it all kind of makes everyone S feel good. Yeah. See, I say that, but I care about the poor much more than Bernie does. Because I want to create a system in which the poor are not poor anymore. Nobody, nobody should be poor. If we had a true free market, nobody would be poor. Right? Um, and th the fact is, and again, Look at Steven Pinker's book. The fact is that nobody in America today is poor if what poverty means, what poor people, what middle class was 100 years ago, or what the rich was 100 years ago. Rich people 100 years ago lived worse off than poor people do today. Right? We have supercomputers in our pockets. Even poor people have supercomputers in their pockets. That's stunning. Right? But you said something kind of funny before, right? Nobody laughed because. Um, <laughs> I got, said, one, I got one, I got one. Robots are taking people's jobs, literally, right now. That's funny. <laughs> because robots have been taking people's jobs for 200 years. Right? The first sewing machines took people's jobs. Every single piece of technology that has been introduced over the last 200 years has taken people's jobs. And what were the consequences? Fewer or more jobs? Not just a little bit more jobs. A lot more jobs. We have a population today of 8 billion people on the planet. Let's assume that about 2 billion of them are actually working. In, in, in uh, I mean, not subsistence farming, actually working and they're grown up. 2 billion people working in jobs, what we call jobs, right? We're talking about 200 years ago, the population of the world was less than half a billion. Almost all of them were subsistence farmers. There were no jobs. Ever since we've introduced technology, all that has happened, all that has happened, is we've created more and more and more and more and more jobs. We've never had a period over the last 200 years where we got fewer jobs. There's always more, because the population has just exploded over the, last, uh, over the last 200 years. And yet, everybody has a job. And indeed, the freer the economy is, the more jobs there are. Like the United States in the 19th century was absorbing massive quantities of immigrants uh, because the capitalism, technology, industrialization, robots create more jobs than they destroy, always, always. So I don't, I don't get what, the, what people are worried about about robots. Now ask me what the jobs of the future are, I don't know. I mean, I know a few that I would like, like a personal masseuse that travels with you everywhere. I mean, you're <laughs> starting to appreciate this uh, the with your travel thing. schedule. I yeah, mean, you yeah. need something like that. Yeah. You know, uh, maybe... I it, thought you were my personal masseuse. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, <laughs> he charges a lot. Have I you charge a, a lot. I'm know. expensive. Yeah. Um, so... He's not regulated by the government. It's a whole freaking thing. <laughs> no license, right? Yeah. No license. You're looking um, at an unlicensed, unlicensed masseuse, masseuse up here, masseuse. people. Unlicensed masseuse. Normally the guys are like, oh, you're kidding. Say, yeah, thanks. I have no idea. We'll get back to that in a moment. All right, so let's, you know, we've, we've already done more than an hour here. I mean, we time have. Time really wow. flew by, and I do want to get to, to Q&A, because I always find that's actually yeah. where, where we can kind of learn the most. But I quickly want to just bring this back to technology in California, yeah. because yeah. you escaped California. You couldn't take it anymore. I was at Berkeley two weeks ago. Uh, I did an event with Turning Point, and we, uh, we had dinner out in San Francisco that night, and literally driving to Berkeley from San Francisco, there are tent cities all over the place. I mean, this is, this is the progressive utopia, right? Yeah. I mean, this is San Francisco. This is the lefty yeah. place that they want to model the rest of the, the country after. There were tent cities everywhere. I saw, I kid you not, I saw a guy shooting up in an alley while we were t taking a turn. Um, when we went to dinner, and we were on a nice street, we went to a steakhouse, our car was parked outside, the car was broken into and they stole my bag. 
So there's some junkie oh, wow. running around San Francisco in my underwear telling my jokes, because my, <laughs> my comedy notebook was in there. Some, I could picture some guy at a tent city yeah. going on and on yeah. about the regressive yeah. left. They're like, shut the <laughs> fuck up already. Um, oh. You but you now have material for a whole show. No, I know. That. I'm just, just on this. On um, he's opening for me next yeah. week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but this was the progressive utopia. This place. Oh, so then so then I take a picture. Get this. I take a picture of the broken glass in the window of the car, and I get literally hundreds of people telling me, "Don't you know there is an epidemic in this city about people just punching in windows and stealing shit?" And then on top of that, people started telling me, "This is absolutely true. There is an app." for people in San Francisco to download so that you can find out where human feces is on the street so that you can avoid those streets when you're walking. People pick this, up the dog ones. They just yeah, forget the dog. No, the dog poop. We're, that, <laughs> that, that, yeah, tough. we're good. <laughs> but, it, but literally for human poop, yep. and you have to download an app to do that. This yep. is in the progressive utopia where now drugs have run rampant. I mean, Berkeley, Berkeley looks like a circus. But, it but, really does look like, uh, like a carny show out there. Always has. But, but look, that, it, <laughs> But Berkeley was the home. Berkeley one, at one time was the home of freedom. I mean, it was the home of free speech. No, but, but, but the people who advocated for free speech in Berkeley didn't, weren't advocating for freedom. They were advocating for a particular type of oppression because they were, they, were the, they were the leftist of today. They were the professors who turned the group of students who today are the nuts into what they are. So I, I, don't, I don't have a romantic vision of the free speech movement of the 1960s. I mean, Ayn Rand wrote extensively about that what was going on in campuses in the 60s, and it was bad. It was not true freedom. They didn't understand what the concept of freedom really was. It was, again, a rejection of reason, a rejection of individualism, a rejection of capitalism, all in the name of doing whatever we feel like doing, right? Feel like doing, and therefore we should be able to feel like saying whatever. It wasn't, it wasn't a proper defense of free speech, and that's why it lost. But look, it's not, this is the thing. Nobody learns from experience. <laughs> There's a statement for you. Nobody learns from experience, right? If people actually learn from what works and what doesn't work, then we would be living in laissez-faire capitalist heaven. But they don't, right? I mean, Berkeley's nothing as compared to Venezuela. Venezuela, people are starving to death. Little babies don't get food. They starve. Uh, people have eaten all their pets. They've broken into the zoos. They've eaten all the animals in the zoos, and there just isn't any more food and people are literally dying, right? Uh, millions of people have now exited Venezuela and are going to Colombia, right? Not exactly a place you want to escape to, you know, to find prosperity, but it's so much richer than Venezuela, right? And yet, this is socialism. This is always the consequence of socialism. And yet, you've got all these young people who want to be socialists. And, and they say, no, that isn't the real socialism. Okay, so. Yeah. What is? Socialism's never been tried. Yes. That's the one that they always yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. But every person who's ever said they were trying socialist created a hell hole, right? So, so take, take, on the one hand, you say that about San Francisco, but also what you notice in San Francisco is the high rises going up. I mean, it's on a, it, I, you know, I lived in San Jose, close to San Francisco, uh, 20 years ago, and it's unidentifiable. It's a city's completely changed. The whole south, south of market phenomena skyscrapers, the construction, even here in Chicago, construction everywhere. So on the one hand, you've got this booming, and on the other hand, you've got massive quantities of homeless people because homeless people know that nothing will happen to them. They can poop anywhere in San Francisco, and there's an app, so yeah. nobody cares. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in LA, LA is another example where there are homeless people everywhere, and, why, and people always are wondered why they're homeless people. And, and because the city of LA has guaranteed that they will build housing for all the homeless people. So they keep building housing and putting the homeless people in, and yet there always are more homeless people, and they don't understand where do these homeless people come from. Well, I don't know about you guys, but when somebody's offering free stuff, like free housing, I'm not gonna stay homeless in Chicago where it's cold. I'm gonna go somewhere where it's warm, and they promise free housing. So the more they build homes for homeless people, the more homeless people there will be. That's basic incentives. This is not hard, sophisticated economics. This is how the world works, right? So, you know, California is this country, this state of complete, you know, dramatic extremes. You know, I live, lived in Orange County, which is like the most pleasant place to live on the planet. It's so beautiful, big streets, everybody's basically rich. And 
it, it, life is wonderful, but you go out to the Central Valley, or you go to Skid Row in LA, or you, you see people as poor as anywhere in the United States. And it's, that's what you have in, in, in California, and fewer and fewer people in the middle. You have wealth, and you have poverty, and, and people in the middle are somehow getting by because their real estate keeps getting more expensive. And nobody can afford to live in San Francisco anymore. Um, and you know what people blame? The fact, there was just a, a, an amazing story in the in Mercury News, which is the local newspaper in, in uh, the Bay Area. Who do they blame for the high cost of living in San Francisco? Who's Trump. to blame? What's Trump. that? Trump. Republicans. Anybody in South Park. Who's to blame? Technology companies. Because they're creating too many jobs. They're creating too many jobs. Right, so they're pricing out. The so, 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 so too many people are coming. So it's, it's their fault, right? And of course, the last piece they blame is local government. Now, it turns out that as an economist, and you go there, the only people to blame are local government because they're not building. They're not giving permits. They're not building high. They're not, you know, so they say there's not enough room to go. They build high. Instead of just office buildings, build condos. They don't build condos in San Francisco. But why? Why don't they build condos in San Francisco? Because the people who live in the nice houses don't, they don't want, want condos. Them. Not in my backyard. Not in my backyard. So nobody, so they don't build high rises, even you know, expensive high rises. They just don't want, they've used block, they don't want whatever, right? So no, but the fault is we're creating too many jobs. It's those greedy capitalists creating too many jobs and creating too much wealth and creating the iPhone, whatever. You know, that's the problem. Right? It's, it's, it's mind boggling and this, this is not hard stuff. So yeah, you should be able to look at San Francisco and say, we don't want that. You should be able to look at Venezuela and say, we don't want that. You should go, be able to go to Hong Kong and say, whoa, what did they do, right? Or, 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 or go to the United States and look at the 19th century and look at what we started and what we ended up and go, whoa, I want to be like that. So this is, goes back to the moral point I made earlier. Let's go study what works and what doesn't. That's true in economics, that's true in politics, that's true in life. I'm a scientist, I want to be a scientist. I want to go on in nature and figure out what works and what doesn't work. And I want to do what works and I want to avoid what doesn't work. Not work in the moment, but work over, over a lifetime, right? And what works is capitalism, what works is free markets, what works is you know, a certain approach to your own individual life, and what doesn't work is socialism and, and, and uh, focusing on uh, you know, guilt and taking care of others and, and, and all of that. If you live a good life for yourself, and if everybody had that attitude, or most people had that attitude, wow. You know, whenever it's been tried, it works amazing. All we have to do is, is, is do it, right? It's just, just do it. That's a Nike thing. So. Yeah, just do just it. Do there it. you go. I we think went you, from you owe Nike to just some money it. right now. <laughs> um, and really, if you want to know how bananas things have gotten in, in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, Peter Thiel is leaving. He's taking his companies and leaving, and he's moving to the freedom-loving Los Angeles. Unbelievable. I mean, think about that, really. He's, he's going moving. For Wacky left to slightly less wacky but, left. But in his estimation, yeah. that, that is how crazy that thing has gotten. I want to mention one so, other thing, so, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So I moved, just so we were clear, I yeah. moved to Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I live in Puerto Rico now. He doesn't just, just talk about not, this shit. He's living it. Yeah, you I'm living it because my yeah. taxes in Puerto Rico are somewhere around 4%. All in. Federal, state, everything. Yeah. 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 Puerto uh, Rico. And right, we're, building, we're building a little political party in Puerto Rico, so if you guys move, yeah? you know, we're going to take the place over. All right, maybe, maybe I'll be the mayor of San Juan or something. You know, right. final thought, you mentioned right. Orange County, and if you want to talk about a really oppressive state government, I, the first time I went to Orange County, I went to a Journey concert, <laughs> and I got busted for smoking weed. At a journey concert, <laughs> yeah. which I thought you had to do, had to do yeah. at a journey concert. So that is what is wrong with the government. All right, well, this, this has been an absolute pleasure. Let me talk to the camera for a second because uh, I do believe in capitalism and all of the good freedom-loving stuff that Yaron and I have talked about here. Uh, and most likely, this video has been demonetized by YouTube already. Um, we are on Patreon. So this live stream right now, is uh, we're going to air the Q&A on that. But if you're watching this on tape delay, as it were, what year did I come up with that phrase from? Tape delay. Uh, the Q&A that we're about to do is going to be a Patreon exclusive, although it'll all be aired live right now.